Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. I think this event was uh, originally scheduled during Snowzilla, so um, thanks for your continued interest and for your patience. I'm glad we're finally uh, getting together. We've got a great event lined up. I just want to briefly set the table. Um, as, many of, as many of you know, last fall the Center for American Progress issued a comprehensive set of proposals to address drug pricing. And at its heart, the guiding concept was a very simple one, that we should price drugs based on their value. Now, since we released that report, we've actually been meeting with lots of stakeholders. We've met with many, many drug companies, believe it or not. And uh, you may be surprised to hear the first thing that drug companies will tell you is that they already do price drugs based on their value. And this may be true for some drugs, but it's definitely not true for many, many drugs. And even when it is true, the American people do not have confidence that it's true. But at least drug companies agree with the basic concept, paying for value. As is so often the case, the devil is in the details. And the most important detail is who should assess value. Now, normally, the free market would determine value. But we're not dealing with a competitive market like the market for flat screen TVs. Drug companies have the market power that comes from monopolies, and insurance coverage insulates consumers from the price. This is why, according to McKinsey, the drug industry has a higher return on invested capital than any other industry at 23.5%. So we should be very skeptical about so-called market-based solutions and that they will be the answer to the problem. They can help a little bit, but only at the margins. For example, when a second brand name drug enters the market to compete with the first brand name drug, Express Scripts can favor one drug over the other and get a discount, but only to a point. The price of the first brand name drug will always artificially inflate the price of the second brand name drug. And the fact is that the FDA already approves two thirds of requests for fast track review. So if normal market forces can't determine value, should we just trust drug companies to price based on value by themselves? The answer is obviously no. We all have a stake in this. We need a transparent process in which independent entities guided by science and evidence assess value. A few months ago, the Center for American Progress convened a roundtable with a broad representation of stakeholders, including insurance companies, drug companies, and patients. This drug pricing framework that you dis see displayed over there is based on input from these stakeholders and subsequent comments from the drug companies. The framework is a very simple one. Because drug companies are charging sky-high prices, insurers have been forced to increase cost sharing on patients. This dynamic is not in anyone's interest. So the solution is obvious. If drug companies price based on value, then insurance companies can reduce cost sharing on patients. Drug companies would get more sales volume, insurers can keep premiums lower, and patients can then access the drugs that they need. It's the rare win-win-win trifecta. I want to be clear that this value-based pricing framework is not the same thing as outcomes-based pricing. A lot of drug companies are touting their outcomes-based pricing agreements as a new innovation. But all these agreements really mean is that drug companies agree to be paid the same sky-high price only if a drug actually works. Think about that. Paying for something only when it works. Is this concept really so innovative? These agreements are helpful, don't get me wrong, but let's not pretend that they are the answer to sky-high drug prices. 
In fact, the word innovation gets thrown around a lot in this town, and ironically, it's used to justify the status quo. But it's not innovative to just merge two companies, especially when it's to avoid paying taxes. There's nothing innovative about increasing prices beyond inflation for existing drugs, which are not adding any more value than they were the year before. It's not innovative to charge such high prices that the resulting financial toxicity actually worsens a patient's condition. There's nothing innovative about spending more on marketing than on research and development. It's not innovative to have to resort to patient assistance programs to make your drugs affordable to patients when the cost is still being passed on to everyone else through higher premiums. As one major investor put it, such actions to prop up stock prices are signs of companies, quote, trying to paper over financially an absence of innovation, absence of innovation. True innovation, in fact, will actually be fostered by paying for drugs based on their value. Our special guest speaker, Congressman Lloyd Doggett, understands all of this really well. As a senior member of the Ways and Means Committee, he led lawmakers in successfully calling on the Treasury to prevent tax dodging through corporate inversions, which appears to have stopped the Pfizer merger. He has led the fight to lower prices for drugs developed using federal funding. He has led efforts to push the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, to fund more comparative effectiveness research on drugs. And he co-founded the Congressional Task Force to Reform Drug Pricing before it was even cool to think about drug pricing. He was way ahead of the game. Perhaps most importantly, I know him as someone who is personally engaged on the issue, reads everything he can get his, get his hands on, genuinely cares about making a difference, who is not only curious enough to learn the substance, but also has a strategic sense about how to go about moving the needle ever so slightly on such a contentious issue. Please welcome Congressman Lloyd Doggett. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you for your kind introduction and certainly to the center for uh, hosting this forum. I know it will lead to a robust discussion. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, this forum was originally scheduled uh, during a January blizzard with a government shutdown that Ted Cruz did not cause. And I think it's a fitting metaphor for the situation we are talking about today. Uh, a blizzard of price hikes about which the federal government has largely been shut down. Healthcare professionals and patients calling 9-11, uh, but they just keep getting put on hold by Congress. As is usually the case here in Washington, the blizzard of price problems has been accompanied by a blizzard of lobbying and campaign contributions. Last year, nine of the top ten pharmaceutical companies increased their spending on lobbying Congress, collectively spending over $50 million. The title of the CAP report that each of you have, Enough is Enough, the Time Has Come to Address Sky-High Drug Prices, pretty much captures it all and outlines a number of needed public policy responses, including specifically value-based pricing. This is not a problem uh, of the smirking face of one bad boy who engineered a 5,000 percent overnight price hike. It's not about one pharmaceutical manufacturer or one class of drugs or one disease. It is a pervasive industry-wide problem. Major pharmaceutical companies have become giant marketing operations. They're expert at defending their monopoly pricing. They're expert at public relations. They're expert at avoiding taxes and wielding political influence. But some are not so expert when it comes to innovation, except by purchasing the successes of smaller companies. Nine out of the ten largest pharmaceutical companies spend more on marketing than they do on research and development. 
but there, there clearly is some public benefit. I'm not sure that broadcast news would exist each night without their advertising. And the underwhelming performance of the pharmaceutical industry comes despite all of the tremendous advantages that it already enjoys. In Congress, of course, most of the health care debate has been about how many times we can repeal Obamacare, uh, now up to, I believe, about 60, not how many times drug prices are arbitrarily hiked. For almost a decade, I think pharma has really won the ultimate victory, removing the issue of exorbitant prices from the legislative agenda almost entirely. Our task force is trying to change that and put it back on the agenda. Of course, not everyone agrees with the AARP report you'll hear about of a doubling of prices for prescription drugs that our seniors most often take over seven years, each year exceeding inflation. Indeed, at the uh, annual J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference back in January in San Francisco, the chairman of Bio, the big industry group, condemned anger at drug prices, reports like we have here today, as, quote, an abomination, insisting that all the talk about profiteering is, quote, a perversion of reality. Apparently, they've not heard from the folks uh, who find a cancer diagnosis is really a prognosis for bankruptcy, nor from the Texas physician who denounced appalling pharmaceutical price hacks where, hikes where even the new drugs, he said, uh, like root, that treat routine conditions like uh, diabetes, which is so prevalent in my state, often costs over $300 a month. Our presidential candidates don't seem to need a hearing aid about these problems. As you know, both Senator Sanders and Secretary Clinton have outlined specific legislative initiatives, and even Donald Trump uh, has endorsed Medicare negotiation and called for making drug prices in America not so great again. Within just the last uh, month, we have the important uh, CMS proposal. Uh, last week we had, or actually I guess it's a couple weeks back, we had the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission or MedPAC proposals, and yesterday recommendations from the Campaign for Sustainable Prescription Pricing. We need vigorous discussion, I'm sure we'll have some of it today, of each of these. None are a panacea. Each of them has its own set of problems but they're all part of trying to address this problem. Legislation is certainly needed. As the struggle for the Affordable Care Act got underway, Dr. Emanuel's brother, Rom, I'm sure he hears about him a lot, decided that he could not pass health care reform over formal opposition. And he actually reached such a good deal with the drug industry that it devoted millions to promoting Obamacare. And given the political realities, I'm not sure he wasn't right about that choice. After Democrats took control back in 2007, it has been a while, uh, the first major bill that was approved in the House was John Dingell's Medicare drug negotiation bill. Though it received the vote of every single Democrat and 24 Republicans, uh, it uh, was blocked in the Senate. And it was that approach that was left on the Affordable Care Act uh, cutting room floor uh, I recognize that our panel, from what they've said in other places, uh, are not all that enthusiastic about this particular proposal. Uh, clearly, it would need to be updated from 2007, but I think it continues to have merit. The Veterans Administration is negotiating prices that are a fraction of the prices that our seniors face. While realizing that they serve a unique and much smaller population than Medicare or the non-Medicare general public, the Veterans Administration is using a formulary based on drug effectiveness. It considers value by reviewing clinical records. It's got all of them electronically now, seeing how well a drug works, and then comparing it to the effectiveness of other drugs. An important California ballot initiative uh, that is led uh, by the AIDS Healthcare Foundation in Los Angeles uh, has attracted uh, much attention and about $100 million of pharma industry opposition and objections from just about every group pharma has ever funded, which are many. Though usually uh, bottled up in committee or blocked uh, in the courts, uh, there is legislative action pending in about a half a dozen states across the country. Federal legislative power 
should focus on reducing monopoly power with more competition, more transparency, more value. The problems are not new. The solutions on many of these issues, like pay for delay, are not new. What is needed is leadership and legislative will. Since there is no cure for the obstructionism we find from this Republican Congress, at least until November, uh, I began uh, last year exploring how the administration could use its legal authority now to try to address this problem. Uh, the administration insistence that the Republican Congress ought to pass a bill, there ought to be a law, sometimes is just an excuse for not doing anything more administratively. The CAP research identified one step that the administration could take, and that's to protect uh, taxpayers from predatory pricing when they've already paid for the research that led to the drug. Under the Buy dole Act of 1980, the National Institutes of Health uh, may require a patent holder to license federally funded intellectual property to third parties. Fifty of us from the House asked Secretary Burwell and Director Collins at the NIH to use that authority to respond to the soaring cost of pharmaceuticals. And since NIH in its uh, time with this act has not previously offered written guidance, we suggested that uh, before any march in rights, as it's called, were used, that a rulemaking process take place and some general guidance could be set out so that a pharmaceutical manufacturer would know what circumstances could lead to the exercise of this right. Declining our request for additional general guidance, Secretary Burwell replied that NIH was prepared to use its march in authority but would evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, thanks to the dedication of Jamie Love, who I believe is here, uh, there is, in fact, a case pending at NIH right now. Uh, we House members have now been joined by Senator Sanders, Senator Leahy, Franken, White House, Warren, and Klobuchar, requesting a public hearing to establish whether March in rights should be exercised for this pending petition on a prostate cancer drug. It was developed at UCLA through taxpayer-supported research and with money from the U.S. Army. A Japanese licensee is charging Americans $129,000 for this drug, while selling it in Japan and Sweden for $39,000 and in Canada for $30,000. The NIH director's answer recently to Senator Dick Durbin in the House, in, in the Senate, uh, Labor and HHS Appropriations Subcommittee, uh, is not very encouraging uh, in response to the Senator's recommendation that this right should be used sparingly to send a message to the industry about high drug prices. Director Collins seemed more concerned with maintaining a close relationship between industry and NIH. Senator Dermott pushed back, noting that, quote, doing nothing sends the opposite message, that it's fair game, open season, to, see, to seek whatever prices they wish. If the administration wants to slow the spike in drug prices, an NIH hearing now on Xtandi is one place to start. The administration could also join our task force members who have urged the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI, uh, to invest more in comparative effectiveness research. Uh, that entity, created by the Affordable Care Act, uh, has, I believe, devoted far too little of its resources to direct research comparing the effectiveness of treatments and particularly comparing the effectiveness of drugs. It's responded to our request and suggests that it would do some modest increase in what, it's, what it has on comparative effectiveness. I think there is much more there uh, to focus on value, to focus on effectiveness, and I'm eager to see the follow-up report that I know uh, the center is doing on PCORI. With the Institute of Medicine conclusion that over half of all treatments that are delivered occur without clear evidence of effectiveness, the FDA could also be doing a great deal more. Instead of only testing whether a drug is better than a placebo, it could look at whether the drug is actually any improvement uh, over existing treatments. There are a set of things the FDA could do to encourage more uh, competition in the way it prioritizes its applications, uh, and that could be done in some other cooperation with HHS without further legislative action. 
and also the administration, uh, which I think included some good proposals in its 2017 budget about increased transparency and evidence development for Medicare Part D, uh, has, not, has not bothered to submit any specific legislation other than the page or so of its recommendations. I previously asked Secretary Burwell to request from pharmaceuticals now the same information she wants, the administration wants, uh, the Congress to mandate be provided. Uh, I think there is not a good reason for not making a request and focusing on research and development. I'm eager to get every idea that this panel has about uh, time, ab about value-based health care. Uh, but I think the experience with Savaldi indicates that even value-based pharmaceuticals that work, and it's done some great work, uh, can break a budget at $84,000 a treatment. The drug industry has, through its paid consultants, created wildly inflated figures on what R&D actually cost. We need comparative data. That's why this uh, effort to get that information and overcome what was, I believe, the last preposterous November 2014 industry claim of about $2.6 billion per drug uh, to provide some response to that. There are other pending issues that we've asked the administration about from gag orders on pharmacists to uh, be able to provide more information to their customers, to recent reports that oversized uh, cancer vials, cancer drug vials, or adding cost, but our basic approach is if something should be done legislatively about pharmaceuticals, why isn't part of it, why isn't it possible, in some cases it's not, but why isn't it possible to do some of it administratively and do it sooner rather than later? And with obstruction not likely to recede in 2017, hopefully by a few votes, uh, I think that these questions are very relevant for the next administration. All of us want an innovative pharmaceutical and biological technology industry. Uh, I'm eager for them to find cures to all these dread diseases before I get them, and I expect most of you are too. But industry plays on fears that those cures will never come to its advantage. There are a number of answers to what I think are log largely misplaced arguments that predatory pricing is the only way to secure innovation. First, the current commitment uh, to uh, innovation, to research, uh, is modest. Only about 17 percent, according to their financial reports, of the uh, effort of Pfizer and Merck and some other uh, companies is devoted to research and development. Second, the price of a drug does not have to include every dollar that was lost on a drug that was not successful because taxpayers are already subsidizing. Uh, these research expenses to the tune of about 57 cents per dollar of research activity, and there are those within the industry that are pressing to raise that to 70 percent. Third, there is no justification for the industry model that compels American consumers, patients, insurers, and governments to finance research for the entire world. In its re recent effort to dodge its responsibilities on the tax front and adopt a carpet address in Ireland uh, while continuing to charge uh, Americans Irish prices, Pfizer was not interested in giving us the luck of the Irish. Uh, in fact, on its top selling drugs, American consumers pay 12 times what the Irish pay for the same drug. If the industry needs a premium, to innovate, it is a premium that needs to be shared with the advanced industrial economies and not borne exclusively by American consumers with grossly higher prices. I think the pharmaceutical industry believes in entitlements. It believes it's entitled uh, to incredible tax advantages and taxpayer finance research while setting prices, as the CAP report indicated, at, at whatever the sky, whatever the limit is, at the sky is the limit. And when it comes to setting monopoly prices, the industry does not believe uh, that there should be a limit. Uh, it is, in fact, whatever a sick or dying person will pay for a little less misery and perhaps a few more months of precious life. The incoming president should know 
that there are a number of us in Congress who care deeply about this issue, this unacceptable situation. Uh, we're exploring the best ways to respond. We're open to finding allies wherever they might be in order to achieve uh, some real progress. I think that anyone with good intent and judgment uh, can disagree about what that path should be, but I don't believe there can be a disagreement about the need to follow a path to address this problem. We need action on all fronts in Congress, from the administration, from the states, from physicians, insurers, private partners, and patients. We don't need any new law or regulation, however, to tell us one thing about value and about drug effectiveness. An unaffordable drug is 100 percent ineffective. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the Congressman for uh, his strong words. Uh, he has been, uh, as Topher said, very much a leader, uh, outspoken leader on this issue and has definitely uh, made this issue of <coughs> marching rights uh, uh, something uh, that uh, someone's going to have to address. Uh, we're here on our panel. Uh, and. Before I introduce the actual panel, I want to apologize for the fact that uh, uh, Peter Bach, who is an uh, expert on uh, uh, drugs and drug pricing from Memorial Sloan Kettering, couldn't be with us. He had a last-minute emergency that unfortunately kept him in New York. We have had to uh, try to get a representative uh, panel here of uh, all the perspectives, uh, and Peter offered a, a very serious and uh, thoughtful academic perspective. Uh, at the far end is Deb Whitman. Uh, she's the Chief Public Policy Officer at AARP, uh, represents patient, uh, patients, many patients, and uh, patient uh, groups in that regard. Josh Offman uh, is Vice President uh, for uh, Global Value Access and Policy at Amgen, uh, a biotech, I guess you're a biotech, biotech slash pharma company out in uh, Los Angeles area. Uh, and Marilyn Tavner, who many of you will know is the former uh, uh, head of uh, CMS and is now the president and CEO of AHIP, America's Health Insurance Plans, uh, representing uh, the insurers. Um, so we're going to have a uh, conversation here going on 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions. Um, Deb. I would like to begin with you. As we were walking in, you said that uh, AARP has done some polling on this issue of d drug pricing. Um, I think, in general, most of us view there is a problem with drug pricing. That's the presumption, and let's move on. I think part of the question is how deep is that perception, and, and what, are the, what does the American public think uh, some of the solutions might be? Thanks, Pat, for having me today. Am I on? Uh, thanks to Kat for having me today, and um, I do represent AARP, and it's 37 million consumers that we're okay. talking about. Um, but really, um, our members, people over age 50, are the ones that take drugs. Um, they're the ones that are breaking out into a cold sweat when they walk up to the pharmacist counter or have to look at what a price increase is over time. Um, and, and so they feel this issue very personally. They and their families have to make trade-offs between paying for their drugs and the ability to pay for other things that they need in life, like housing or heating or food. Um, so, so this is very personal to them. And when we asked people over age 50 if this should be a political issue, and um, Zeke, I think you know the polls on pretty much any issue um, are all over the place, um, it's not on this. 87% of people over age 50 believe that their politicians need to take action to address drug costs. Now, 87 percent, that's people in, on the red side, people on the blue side, people in between, all agree that this is an issue. And I, I think that's because they do feel this out of their own um, paycheck and pocketbooks. Um, older consumers, three quarters of them take a drug. 
Um, and we heard in that same survey that about 40% are really concerned about cost individually. And in fact, one in four didn't fill a prescription. So it is affecting their health, it is affecting their pocketbook. Um, and, and these are issues, I think, that they as individuals feel powerless to negotiate, um, feel powerless to solve. So they're really looking for answers. Um, maybe I can continue just one more question. So ARP uh, position on various solutions, maybe you can help us try to understand that a little bit more. I think we believe that there's no one silver bullet um, and that there's going to have to be a multi-pronged approach. Um, so this can range from a direct secretarial negotiation for, for Medicare, which is the largest purchaser of drugs in which um, the secretary is prohibited from having any ability to negotiate, um, to even things of looking at uh, duels. People who are on both Medicare and Medicaid have to pay a higher price for a drug than if they were just on Medicaid. Um, we are very strong supporters in having more research on comparative effectiveness. Um, if you go online like I did to look at toasters, I can get all kinds of information about from consumer reports about which is the best toaster. Really hard to do that on, on medication, which may cost you know hundreds or thousands of dollars. Um, pay for delay was mentioned. We've been strong supporters for that. Um, the Bidol ability to march in is another uh, issue that the government should think about. I think consumers want to know how a price is set. They want transparency about that and whether they're paying at the research point and also at the point of sale. So those are a few I could list could go on. But as you can see, I think ARP is very serious about finding solutions that will affect our members. Josh. Uh your view on the uh, drug pricing issue and how, from the pharmaceutical perspective, we might go about uh, addressing it. Sure, um, it's great to be here. And you know, just to address the the comments from a consumer's perspective, I think anytime you talk to consumers, and, and we've done it, and our industry has done it as well, and they talk about what they're spending on drugs, that out-of-pocket expense. There's two components to that. You know, one obviously is the price of the drug, and the other is their insurance design. So as we move forward and talk more about value, we have to talk about these things together: um, the value of biopharmaceuticals and the value-based in the insurance design themselves. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But I do find it very uh, important that we take a step back and recognize that, you know, we're all concerned, Amgen, all of us, about rising healthcare costs. And the key driver of that and the common enemy in the room it, are the diseases themselves. The unrelenting increasing costs of cardiovascular disease that are currently costing us about $600 billion in this country today. Cancer that continues to ravage our families, taking 2,000 lives a day. And upcoming Alzheimer's disease, which is projected to cost over a trillion dollars by 2050. If we don't address the cost of disease, um, healthcare will most certainly become unsustainable. And we believe, I believe, that biopharmaceuticals represent our best chance of curbing the cost of those, disease, those diseases. And I think there are two things that we can do right away that will be very helpful. First, we do embrace a robust discussion about value. But whose value? Value from some monolithic organization? Value from patients? value from providers, whose value? I think what everybody here needs to understand is that assessments of value using cost-effectiveness analysis require a threshold to make any statement about value. And that threshold means we have to place an economic value, a dollar value, on a year of quality-adjusted life. And we simply in the United States have not had those conversations. Should it be the same for the disabled and the elderly? Should it be the same for people with cancer or cardiovascular disease or children? Those are the conversations we have to have if we're really going to have a meaningful conversation about value-based pricing, and we're simply not having them. Tom Phillipson, a noted health economist from University of Chicago, has written extensively on the fact that applying a rigid cost-effectiveness threshold is, in fact, a price control. And so we just have to get our arms around, uh, around this and have those deeper conversations. 
Marilyn and I have talked at length about the fact that we are now beginning to have better conversations, business to business conversations between payers and manufacturers about value. But there are lots of different assessments about value that come to very different conclusions. So we can do some things right away with some regulatory reform, you know, loosening some of the constraints on biopharmaceutical companies and what we can talk about uh, before we launch drugs and around the times we launch drugs. Some of the regulatory constraints around anti-kickback statutes and FDA, FDAMA 114, so that we can have more productive, more robust, and better conversations about the value of biopharmaceuticals using market-based approaches, looking at all the different assessments of value, because there is a lot of guesswork right now going into these value assessments. And what value assessment uh, A says over here might be very different than what value assessment B says over Just there. Just to be clear, Josh, you are accepting the fact that we have to price on value. Uh, as a, you're accepting that that value is determined by some cost effectiveness, and what you want to have a, is a discussion about where the threshold should be. Now, what, I, what I'm suggesting is that value, you, cost effectiveness is one method of trying to get at the economics behind pharmaceuticals. There are others as well. What's the others? There are cost minimization analysis. There are net health benefit analysis. There are a lot of different economic tools. We should be using all of them, and they should inform a conversation about value, because value will be different. So you're not agreeing to value-based pricing? I think that value should play an important role in informing our pricing. But, but what else should inform There it? is no single answer around value, and so to suggest that a value-based price should be the thing that sets price, I think, is just not uh, a, a reality-based recognition of what these economic analyses can tell us. So I think we can do a lot. I think the other thing we can do is address the insurance design issues that I think are hampering patients' ability to pay for drugs. Currently, um, you know, we pay and our well, I don't want you to filibuster, okay. so le let's talk to <laughs> Marilyn. Um, I didn't know you were a congressman yet, or a senator. Um, uh, Marilyn, uh, the insurance industry has been pretty vocal about drug pricing, especially around Zavaldi, um, and uh, has gotten some criticism for what Josh points out is this, you know, taking a situation where the deductibles are, you know, half the cost of a drug. Um, how does the insurance industry view how should we approach this other than just passing the cost on to patients, make not, you know, basically making it not an insurance policy? So let me start by saying I think that um, the pricing issue, there's always been, plans have always supported innovation. And with innovation, there's a certain cost. I think what happened in the case of Savaldi is that normally the expenditure that plans absorbed or whatever they passed on to consumers was kind of a steady, predictable thing. And all of a sudden, you have a new drug and you go from a small kind of uh, accepted cost of doing business to this tremendous explosion. And I'm not just talking about insurance plans. It's also Medicare. It's also Medicaid. Uh, so it was also a, you know, a state budget buster. It was, you know, if you look at Part B and Part D spending, you can kind of pick the, the top five categories and see how quickly this has gone up. And the problem is it's not sustainable. And no matter how we design insurance policies, currently we pay about 90%, okay? So yes, there are some high co-pays and deductibles, and that's been particularly true in the exchanges, and that's been brought to light. And there have been different approaches to try to deal with that, whether it's cap the copay or whatever. But all this comes back to that price has got to be absorbed somewhere, and it's either going to be absorbed in a premium or in a copay or a deductible. So I think it's kind of a, a, if you will, a red herring to say that that's the problem. And so what would your recommended uh, or the industry's recommended approach or recommended set of approaches? Right. Since there, almost all of us agree there's not going to be one magic bullet here. Well, I agree there's not one magic bullet, and there, there are many different approaches. We've tried to stress three, although certainly the conversation about uh, PCORI and comparative effectiveness, while we've not talked about that a lot publicly, we've talked about that directly with PCORI and trying to speed up the timeline on getting some of these studies completed. Um, but I will say the top three that we've talked about are not particularly unique, and you all have talked about them in some. It's anything that promotes competition, so we would be against anything that extended patent life, 
that did not allow for robust competition to occur as quickly as possible. We've also talked about transparency, and uh, yes, we've been participating with our state health plans in California and, and Massachusetts and some of the more, um, if you will, aggressive uh, state work that's gone on around transparency and trying to make sure that it was robust and clear about what goes into the pricing of, of, a, of a drug. And then I'd say the last area that we have pushed and I believe strongly in is value-based purchasing and this whole issue of pharma has to be pulled into what is the individual's outcome and how do you coordinate an approach that includes pharma. To say that pharma sits aside from that is not realistic. So um, I'm a little uh, uh, curious on uh, the issue of uh, both transparency and competition. Uh, you know, if you've got a monopoly drug that is, uh, um, you know, uh, Zavaldi, for example, what competition is there? And what uh, transparency is only going to tell you, yeah, transparent, but, you know, we're charging a thousand. Yeah, we'll tell you what all the information is. So what? That what? The problem wasn't we didn't know how much it cost to develop. We actually had a pretty good idea because, you know, Gilead bought a company where the drug was developed and we knew what the inputs are and we knew what the costs and what actually the company was planning to charge. Uh, so why are those solutions? I don't see why those, I mean, I have to say we have a, we talk a lot about transparency because it's easy who can be against transparency unless you're a drug company. And we talk a lot about competition, which is of course always red meat to Americans, but it doesn't seem to me in the drug business those actually solve anything? Well, I think there's start. Like I said, I think there's probably 10, 12 more approaches that, that many people have thought of, but I think this is a good way to begin. And the reason that I am high on transparency, as I think we saw through some of the congressional work around Savaldi, that if it is a public process and there is some indication, right now how drugs are priced is very opaque. And so you don't have a good idea of what's going into the pricing. And, yet government subsidizing it on the front end, and you can argue that the country's subsidizing it on the back end when, if you compare pricing to other countries. So I think we need to have some degree of understanding. And the reason I talk about competitiveness is because there's still work underway to actually extend patents. And we just filed an amicus brief in the Supreme Court case that kind of came in through a non-healthcare channel. So I'm into making sure that we're transparent about what's going on there as well, and that we're not doing things that act actually extend patent life. And Zeke, to add on that, I think when Americans see that Sovaldi cost $84,000 in the U.S., $60,000 in the U.K., and $900 in Egypt, they think something's wrong. Um, I think we're finally to a point where the American taxpayer funding the research and the American consumer and uh, employer and taxpayer funding the actual cost of the drug as the sole source of funding innovation has to stop. These, these gains are shared throughout the globe, and there's no reason why the American market, other than the structure of our market, should bear the highest cost in the world. Um, are you either, Marilyn or Deb, uh, uh, for getting rid of the monopoly pricing power of, uh, that's in the patents or limiting it or further restricting it? Well, I would say I'm definitely against further restricting patent power. So I would want to do everything we could that would um, move toward shortening patents. You want to shorten the patents? Yes, I would love to. I think that would be helpful. And I think you have to balance that against what it does to you know, innovation and creativity. So I think there's a balance there. Definitely not for extending them. I think we have pretty robust patent life. Um, so I'd say that's where I stand on, on that issue, Deb. I think I'd add just, you know, I'm an economist, so uh, monopoly is having market power because you have the one product. Monopsony is that you are the one buyer and that you have actually market power by, by being a purchaser. We have entities, the federal government, who could be a monopsonist purchaser. Purchaser and and use that power on the other side to negotiate and push back. Again, well, so let's explore that for a second. And I I, I do think uh, Representative Doggett was probably referring to be that uh, so, somewhat skeptical about about Medicare being a monopoly, uh, being able to negotiate prices and how effective it would be. I think I am skeptical of it, and I want to push back on you. Yes, let's say Medicare was uh, going to be a single purchaser, uh, use its monopsony power. Um, 
wouldn't that hurt me <laughs> as the rest of the American public? Because assuming Josh doesn't want to lose revenue and lose profits, he gives you a better price, he's going to give Maryland a higher price. I take it that that's just going to be the dynamic, and so the 150, 60 million Americans who have private health insurance are suddenly going to be screwed by this system. If you have a closed market, yes, this is a global market, right? And the, we've already established that they are receiving monopolistic prices. So there is room to cut back in vast areas, still reward innovation, still reward the companies. But I guess maybe that some of that gets spread across the globe, not just to the American consumer. So, maybe, John, maybe John, I do want to give you a chance. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you can know, filibuster now for a short time. No, I'm no filibuster. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm, I'm joking, joking John. So I think that um, you know this discussion about our patent system is is very interesting. But you know our intellectual property system in the United States is very robust, and it's preserved our national innovative capacity for decades. What we have to understand is that the innovation system in the United States for drugs is working. Let me give you an example. Just in the last four years, because of patent expiration and the entry of generic drugs, uh, that has freed up over $90 billion. Okay, we'll call that headroom for innovation to pay for new innovative medicines. In the next five years, IMS and others have projected another $85 billion will be freed up from the patent expiry and the generic prices that will occur. That's an innovation system that's working. Okay? The 3 to 4% um, of our sickest patients who get specialty drugs, right? That's, that is more than enough to pay for all of the specialty drugs in any given year in the United States. So that's an innovation system that's working. So I know, I know there's a lot of discussion about patent protection, but I think we have to recognize that this is a system that's working. The, the talking points about prices in Europe versus the United States need to be understood from a very different perspective. The prices of health care generally, not just drugs, hospital care, physician care, every procedure, every device are dramatically lower in those markets than in the United States, not just drug prices all of them. And that's because these are single payers who impose significant price controls. That's oh. a very different model in most markets. But th that's not true in every market. It's not in every market, okay. but in most the, In, there in are. the Netherlands, there are 22 insurance companies. Uh, There's not a single payer. Understood. And their they, prices are still lower. But they are using price controls. Cost effectiveness thresholds and other tools are, in fact, price controls. So there are price controls, but, but when someone calls out drug prices are 50% higher in the U.S. and Europe, all of the prices for healthcare services are dramatically higher. So I'm not sure what the, what the point of well, that is. Well, but is that a vote for our system or a vote against well, our we, system? We don't have. We have a pluralistic, decentralized healthcare system. Well, Josh, Josh, in all fairness, last I looked, Medicare sets prices for doctors and hospitals. Medicaid sets prices for doctors and hospitals. About half the American healthcare system, prices are set by the government for that entity. The idea that we don't have pricing power in the United States. The only segment of that's left out of that government pricing power, if I'm, are you. Well, let me, let me correct something there. So first of all, when we sell a drug to, I, I wish Peter were here, to Memorial Sloan Kettering. Memorial Sloan Kettering might charge one of your companies two to 10 times more for that drug, okay? And the patient is paying the full copay on the list price, that 10 times higher price, not the price that we sold it to them. So the patient is being punished. So while, while the government sets our, the ASP, that hospital is charging whatever it wants to the insurance company, and the patient is paying an enormous copay as a result of that. That's in hospitals. For insurance companies, we often negotiate with insurance companies large rebates around some of our largest drugs. The patient doesn't take advantage of that. The patient is getting charged a co-insurance or co-payment on the list price of the drug, not on the acquisition price of the drug by the plan. So there's a, this is very complex. Anybody who thinks that this is very simple is mistaken. There is a lot of complexity. And if we're going to think about drug pricing, we have to think about it very holistically but, but Josh, from actually, the insurance design okay, and the value. On, on that pricing transparency issue, it does seem to me that a lot of that rests in your hands. If you don't want to do discounts, if you want to have transparent prices, you could negotiate that into your deals. And it 
I mean, I often hear drug companies saying, you know, we can't stand the discount game here. We wish there were no discounts. Seems to me you could say, we're not discounting. Here are our prices. List price is actual price. If, you could do that. If we did that, and if we were to do it, it still isn't helping the patient. Because the patient is going to pay uh, co-insurance based on that price. The price that the hospital may upcharge. So there's all kinds of prices in the marketplace, and we need to address all of it. And I think what I see is someone. So, how are the drug companies proposing to address their part of it, which is the highest part of it? Right. So, I think there's two, two pieces. So, from the value based pricing perspective, let me I tell you. You didn't endorse that. No, let me tell you how we think we should approach this. Um, we, when we set, and we have to think about pricing in two different ways. When you set a, a price for a new drug, that's one set of activities, and then there's pricing for in-market products. That's a very different dynamic. You mean the price increases year to year on something? Or how prices evolve over time. So, because they, they don't all go up year to year. There are prices that change yes, for when, good When reason. they go generic, the and price think, comes down, but I, in general, that's right. and they, they always, otherwise always go up. They always come down, right, when the prices go generic. So, when you do a value assessment on a drug, you should think about the drug's price through its life cycle, both the on-patent and off-patent period. So we at Amgen, what we do is we say, okay, we're gonna, we've got a drug in the pipeline that we're developing for Alzheimer's disease or gastric cancer. We will do a value assessment. We'll use experts around the globe to help us, and we will come up with some estimation of what we think the value that this drug brings to the marketplace. Then we look in the market and we say, what are the market factors? Are there prices that exist in the market? What's the competitive dynamic? What are the market factors? And then we do pretty extensive research with payers, providers, and patients about what they're willing to pay for the drug. So then we come up with what we think is a price valued, you know, anchored in value. And we ask ourselves, is that a sufficient return to continue to fund what at Amgen is a $4 billion R&D engine? And, and we set our prices that way. Um, and so. This, the idea of transparency, while important, uh, we don't believe that we should be giving out competitive information that will make us anti-competitive. And we're not sure how a lot of that information is going to help patients because it's not really related to how we set our prices. You didn't hear me once say manufacturing network costs or you know, development costs for that particular. Right. We're looking at a $4 billion R&D engine that we're trying to maintain and sustain. By the way, what's your marketing budget? I don't, I don't know that offhand, but we, we spend close to 20%, uh, I believe, on, a year on R&D. And marketing in general is over 20, between 20 and 30. Perhaps. Well, yes. Unfortunately, I don't think all of the pharmaceutical industry is following that model. I mean, we've seen examples through congressional investigations of how some country companies are pricing their drugs. And it's not necessarily on, on what the consumers can pay or what comparison. It's how much can we jack up this price at the highest amount in order to get a profit? And, and there's, no, there's nothing that can stop more and more companies from doing that. There's nothing that can stop a company from increasing a price from year to year by hundreds or thousands percent. And, and so the market is not rational at all from a consumer's perspective. You're right, they, they don't know how much they're paying. ASP, AWP, discounted, all of those are completely transparent to the, to the consumer who with every, uh, everything else, they can, they can look at those amounts and understand why am I paying this amount right now? And, and this is a marketplace that is completely... Josh, would you agree possible. to limits on year-to-year uh, -year price increases on branded drugs that correspond to either increase in the CPI or increase in GDP? Because we've seen Listen. lots of increases that bear no relationship to economic growth or and certainly no more innovation on that or no more added value, as Topher it's said. It's an important question, but what Topher said, I think, is, is actually misguided and not correct. Topher implied that uh, there is never increasing value once a product comes on the market. That's just not accurate. Um, drugs evolve quite a lot when they're on the market. The evidence evolves. The numbers of indications change, often change dramatically. Um, the, the devices that are associated with them to make them more compliant, more adherent, and easier to use change dramatically. The formulations change, the manufacturing change. So there's a, a lot that goes on with the drug once it gets onto the market, and some of that requires enormous investment. So, you know, sp uh, I think someone said in Wall Street Journal it, it takes pennies to make a new formulation for a drug. That's just not at all correct. It can take millions of dollars and long periods of time to create a new device. It has to go through a full FDA 
regulatory process again. You mean a new pill? Just no, a new device, just a new uh, device to deliver the drug. So these are enormous processes I think people don't fully understand. And so prices may change in the market when those investments well, are required. Uh, some of our drugs have had seven label changes in the course, seven new indications since they've been launched. The value proposition has changed dramatically for some of those products, and their price has as well. Would you agree if none of that happens, we ought to have price increases that are linked not to whatever the drug company wants, but to either GDP or CPI? I think it's worth thinking about for products that are on the market where there is no activity, no evolution of their value proposition, that those ideas are worth thinking about. Marilyn, would you find that an acceptable solution, or at least not a solution, but at least a proposition? So I don't know that that particularly is going to handle our current problem. So I, I really look at the issue of um, what goes into the transparency and how a drug is priced initially as being the problem. If you're agreeing to CPI or, or some kind of medical inflation and it's already 10 times what the market would bear, what does that solve? Okay, so l let me flip it around to you. Jo Josh is not willing to say we ought to have a value-based pricing model. It should be one component of a more complicated model. If the drug industry were willing to say we're going to have a value-based pricing and that value-based pricing is going to be based upon some cost effectiveness and then we can debate where the threshold is, would the insurance industry be willing to have drugs at the lowest tier? Those so, drugs, those value-based drugs priced at the lowest tier. So I actually think there's already some work going on in that area and, and Amgen has actually done some work with plans. Um, kind of geared in that direction. So I think we'd be very interested in that. And if you look at the Lilly and Anthem work about how you can change so you don't have to start off with best price, you could actually start off with some kind of creative models to determine if these are effective and you could have some predictability about what's coming to market and how you could work together. We'd be very interested in that. And we've been pretty open about that. And it would allow some market-based activities to, to flourish, to work. I want to, um, uh, finish just this section in talking about the California initiative uh, to uh, um, use the VA price. Um, now, uh, if that passes, uh, it would suggest that there's a lot of public sentiment, and I got to believe that it would have an effect on what we do in Washington. Um, and I think the notion that 87% of the public is also you know, mostly no one starts legislation unless 70% plus, 87%. I was like, I've been sitting here trying to think, is there any other piece or issue that I think 87%, 9 out of 10 Americans agree on? I mean, that's kind of an incredible threshold uh, because support will, will decrease. But would this change the dynamic uh, substantially, and do you think this would sort of force a different mentality? Marilyn? So I think that it certainly would, it would be... Um a wake-up call to to the pharma industry and to just how passionate people are about drug pricing. Again, you have to wonder if it doesn't just get into a different type of cost shifting, kind of like yeah. how you feel about Medicare and negotiated pricing, which I have not been a fan of because I just felt that just pushed pricing onto another part of the economy. And I think that's what you'd have to do. I do think it sends a very strong wake-up call and probably would result in uh, pharma being more proactive about value-based purchasing and other approaches. It, is AHIP supportive of the California Initiative, neutral or against? So we, we have been supportive of, of anything that moves at transparency. We have not weighed in on this issue of the VA pricing for the very reason that I've talked about. Is it a shift to other payers? Josh? I think it could have some unintended consequences. First, you know, it would undermine the efforts to get pricing aligned with value because now pricing is just being arbitrarily assigned to some institution. And, and I think it wouldn't improve anybody's knowledge of how the rationale behind that. I think that's point one. Um, point two, I think in, in California, it, it might also undermine our ability to do market-based approaches. I think if you talk to people who were involved in setting the Medicaid best price legislation, and I have talked to many of them, they almost uniformly regret it. Because again, as a price control, it has now set the ceiling uh, for discounts. 
And that's not what anybody would like. In fact, we're thinking hard about ways of getting around that. So that is a natural consequence of price control. So setting at VA prices is just going to have another set of unintended consequences like all price controls have. And but that's what Josh, I worried about. Josh, isn't it a response? So I take it that the logic behind the legislation is the following. We got a pricing problem. We don't have a solution. The VA gets the lowest prices in the system at the moment. On, in general, does anybody know that? In general, that's I think uh, the the prevailing view. All right, let's pluck those. It's not that it's the best solution, but in the absence of the pharma industry coming to negotiate about a solution, we'll do that. Agreed. It's far from optimal. But what's our alternative? I would ask the people who set Medicaid best price whether they would they would want to experience that again. Deb, ARP's view on this? There's lots of states that are considering different options. Yeah. And, and they're, yeah. uh, but California is the most advanced and actually Cal looks California like it might pass. The most advanced. And, and I think you're right. I think what you're hearing is for a widely recognized problem, people are asking for a solution. Um, do I think this is the only solution? Do I think it's the best solution? Do I think state by state solutions are the right way to go? Probably not. But we have to be able to have some way to look at the costs of these drugs. And, and you know, if, if you look at what um, Sovaldi has impacted state budgets from, um, from just the treatment side, it's almost equal to what they could pay for all of higher education. So, so states are feeling the, the pinch on this in a way with a closed budget that, that I think Washington has sort of ignored for a well, while. So, I'm going to take another minute and a half. I have to say, uh, just to get the Zavaldi thing, again, this is, this is one issue which I'm probably out of uh, uh, certainly a lot of colleagues, which is I've never written a negative thing about the Zavaldi because it is a cost-effective drug. That, that's the first thing. And the second thing is this report, the sky is going to fall. The you know, insurance companies are going to go bankrupt. States are going to go bankrupt. Um, didn't really pan. And I think you get a sort of chicken little phenomena here, which is we can't afford it, we can't afford it. Turns out we did afford it. But, but not everybody got treatment. I mean, I think a lot of states are managing around it. So some states you have to have a liver biopsy in order to get the drug. But They're this is bringing up. The, the sickest folks. And, you know, I would like to well, see everybody. Was that a problem? It, it is, because I'd like to see everybody cured of, of hepatitis. Well, but this uh, is a great example of the challenge uh, in assessing value. There is no single answer to value. Let me use another example, PCSK9s. Um, no, 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 let's stay, stay with Zavaldi. Well, why, why, Zavaldi. Why, it, I'll it's use pretty whatever. clear that Zavaldi there were on a cost-effectiveness analysis there were, is under 50,000 per there, let, me, let me just tell you why it's so important that we get this right. Um, estimates came out about Zavaldi, PCSK9s, that were astronomical. They were going to bankrupt the healthcare system. There were estimates about PCSK9s. No, no, Josh, excuse me, excuse me. Let's be very clear. The cost effectiveness analysis. I'm not talking about. I'm wait, wait. The cost effectiveness analysis had it under fifty thousand, and by everyone's definition, that is value. There's no one who says it's not value. Even Britain said it was value. On affordability, That's which right. is not value. That's affordability right. is a different m metric. Agreed. Well, you use the word term value. You use the term. You didn't well, but, use the term affordability. But the assessment I'm referring to, that came out, used the word value to address affordability, and that's a pr another problem. So we, we, we have an, uh, reports out there um, that are out there talking about health system value and calling affordability issues health system value and is confusing everybody. The assessments that are being put out there are oftentimes very alarmist. In fact, they're intended to ring alarm bells. They're using very unrealistic estimates about market uptake and market growth. Our own PCSK9 inhibitors, there were estimates that it was going to raise insurance premiums in a single year by $124 just for this one group of drugs. Okay, I think you're familiar with that estimate as well. It was cited multiple times. In fact, Avalier has showed that on a monthly basis, drugs accounted for only a little more than $3 of insurance premium increases. So these numbers, these assessments that are being put out there, there is a large amount of guesswork that is implicit in them. And I think everybody needs to understand that is why you would never want a single assessment of value. It is but highly jo again, uncertain. Josh, I think you're confusing the, uh, excuse me, but I do think you're confusing the issue here. 
value based on cost effectiveness and affordability are two separate things. We're talking about value here. We're not talking about affordability at the moment. Yeah, but even in the assessments of true value using cost effectiveness analysis, there are enormous numbers of assumptions that are going into those assessments, and it we just can, simply keep doing represents them. guesswork. The, the but idea... Even, but even if we do calculate what the value is in quality-adjusted life years, should the pharmaceutical companies take all of that value from the health care system? Should consumers benefit from having their, their, their treatment? Should the broader health care system... Well, I take so it on cost-effectiveness analysis, Deb, we assess <coughs> value, the improvement in your health, that's what you're getting as a consumer, and the price, that's what it's worth to us. And I think there is some consensus, whether it's 50,000 or 100,000, there's some consensus somewhere in that ballpark is right. But a lot of drugs, a lot of drugs that are certainly in my area, oncology, the cost effectiveness ratio is north of 250, north of 350. And uh, there are plenty of drugs where um, uh, it's north of 300,000 because the price of the drug is 300,000 per year. But there's actually been some work to answer your question. So I think that it's a, it's a false assumption that the firm is capturing all the value. So Goldman and colleagues did a huge study on cancer drugs, on cancer drugs, and no, they, no, and no. they no. looked L at the L social L value, and the firms took 10% of the social yeah, yeah, value. No. The rest came to society. Almost no one believes that study. Societal value is, is real. OK, no one, uh, almost no one because uh, of how, who and how. Um, all right, I think uh, uh, I've taken too much time on this. Uh, we have a number of questions <laughs> over here. Tell us who you are, and please make your question succinct, or I will cut you off. I will. Carl Schmidt with the AIDS Institute. Great discussion. I think it's really important to have an honest discussion on pricing. And we heard, you know, the Savaldi um, case, and people said eighty-four thousand dollars. Well, it's not. No one pays that, and there's been a lot of competition. There's a couple more products on the market now, and we, you know, we now hear that the drug is, you know, less in the United States as it is in the United Kingdom um, today. But um, the question I have is that we've been finding a lot of um, plans putting in the HIV market on uh, every single drug, including generics, on the highest tier. When you know, 50% cost sharing ends up to be a couple thousand dollars for a patient, and we feel this is discrimination. Question: yes. You said you were going to be quick, and you okay. didn't adhere to it. You're, so, you're trying to um, fill a does a hip support? You know, I guess you're, I, I, we realize that drugs cost money, but. You know, it seems that some plans are putting the out-of-pocket cost on the prescriptions. Okay. that's the question. We got the question. Do you support the um, non-discrimination provisions? Well, of course we support non-discrimination provisions, and I think that what um, we are trying to do with the different tiers is, with the pricing being what it is, we are going to put, as the price of a medicine goes up, it's gonna, we're going to make sure it's got correct clinical criteria. We're going to try to keep that clinical criteria up to date, but it's not a discrimination process. It's about trying to make sure that individuals with chronic disease and particularly with expensive disease are being treated with the right drug, right time, that we're, they're not being, it's as much to protect the consumer as it is otherwise. And I do understand the issue of any time there's a 20% copay. And this is where I think it is important that plans have wide variety of products, which then, because the con to that is it can be confusing to consumers, but consumers have to look and engage about what is the right product for them to buy based on their personal history. And so I think we've got a lot of education to do in that area. I think you'll see the plans getting a lot more consumer-centric in that and trying to educate people beforehand because I do think high copays and deductibles are here to stay in some form, so we need to be very aggressive. In but Marilyn, I do, I, I, so let me push this argument a little different. Uh, is like I go to a lot of plans and I notice that insulin, uh, which diabetics have to take, is tier two. And I'm like, always scratch my head. I said, shouldn't it be free? Literally free, because you want them to take it and whatever your cost share is gonna be a bad idea on the long term. So you should know from my perspective, I have a child who's type one diabetic, so you're talking, you're preaching to the choir here, but I don't have a problem with the tier two. Here's why. I also, people have to understand what is the right amount of insulin to buy, what type of insulin to buy, and how frequently to, to, to get it, how to store it. So I think there's also some education that goes on with tier pricing, not just as a block. I don't think any plan wants to block insulin. It's a life-saving drug. 
but then don't get me going on the other side, which is I ride down the street at my home and there's a sign up for people reselling glucose strips because there's not enough controls around the number of glucose strips you have, which actually are just as expensive as, as insulin. But as an aside, insulin's also gone up two or three hundred percent in the last couple of years, and I don't understand why. Okay, so there's all, all right. kinds of issues here. Next question. Yeah. Tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Miller. I'm a physician doing health policy for about 28 years, but most of that involved uh, pharmaceutical access and innovation and prices. Question, and sort of question, please. And I'm the senior, I'm a health, senior question. health and life sciences. You know, tell me who I am. I Zeke. want the question. All right. Zeke, you said that, you know, you get, everybody keeps talking about prices. The price is this, the price is the price. But you've mentioned yourself that there is no one price. I mean, the reason California is going after VA prices are the only published set of prices. Everything else is for good reason, you know, negotiated Question. and, and non-transparent. Would the panelists like to talk about how increasing just transparency about the different level of prices from manufacturers to companies to co-pays to rebates, everything else, would promote competition or would actually inhibit competition and in pricing? Thank you. I want to uh, I'm happy to start. I think it's a mixed bag. I think that, um, you know, right now there is a powerful set of market-based approaches in the marketplace. Um, you know, we operate in some very uh, complex disease states with multiple competitors, and these are some of the fiercest negotiations, you know, I've ever experienced between PBMs, health plans, manufacturers. So if you believe that that market-based... Like those negotiations or not? I think those are good market-based approaches. If you were to then reveal all of the competitive nature of the data within those, I think it would inhibit competition. And I think you've heard many economists writing about this same so you're exact against issue. Transparency. No, no, no. It depends what level of transparency we're talking about. There's much that's already transparent, and we think that's good. We believe that if you're going to take transparency further, let's make sure we understand how and why it will All benefit right, Josh, patients. what are you for? How far are you willing to take it? What would you be willing to reveal? I think right now in our SEC filings, uh, there is a lot of information about R and D expenses, about the percentage. Are, but that's and not pricing. I think are when you, you willing to do? You already told us it wasn't pricing. Are you willing to reveal pricing? Say you negotiate with uh, United or Anthem. Are you willing to reveal those prices? Those would be com that would be very competitive information that you I wouldn't think, want to reveal. No, that, that no I think would I think that would undermine competition. So well, I, I think we'll move more to transparency even on this issue, and it will be a mixed bag. So I agree. But, for instance, if you look at plans now that have narrow networks, part of having a narrow network is you're going to reveal the cost improvements that you made. And you may do it in general terms, like uh, uh, there was a recent report by McKinsey that talked about narrow networks being 10 percent or 20 percent. So you're starting to talk comparatively. It'll be done in more general terms. But I think the public is going to demand more and more transparency about, this, about these issues. Right there. Right now. Yeah. Dr. Caroline Poplin. I'm a physician and an attorney. I work with a firm that brings off-label marketing cases against pharmaceutical companies, so I've seen a lot about pricing. Given the difficulty that you explain about value and determining value, why don't we go to cost-based pricing like we do in other situations, such as utilities, other monopoly situations? Because drugs are very different great, one from great another. Great question. Very succinct. You get the gold star. Yeah, I think, uh, the, I think the last thing you'd want to do with the biopharmaceutical industry is to make it a public utility. Um, when, you, when you see that happening, you know, this is a highly innovative industry that depends and requires enormous amounts of capital investment. As Zeke mentioned and Topher mentioned, the life cycle of developing these products can be 10 to 15 years. I won't bother commenting on the, the cost because I know people have an adverse reaction to that. They're very expensive, they take, and we take enormous risk. And in that type of business model, it requires enormous capital investments and public utilities. Are Gosh, I'm always surprised when you, everyone says risk and your return to capital is 23%. That, that, that's not exactly risk. Well, I if mean, you look it at is the that you start out with a large number and you end up with a small number. But on the risk base on capital, you're getting a really good return, man. The risk-based capital is uh, a return based on the fact that we have a free market for the products that make it to the market. 23% is the highest of any industry, and there are lots of industries taking risk, too. So uh, another question, way in the back.
Hi, Matt Miller with the Capital Group in LA. Quick question for everyone. Um, Hillary has a proposal to cap uh, co-pays at two fifty a month for, uh, I think, specialty drugs. Uh, do you support it or not, and why or why not? Marilyn, you want to start with that? I'll start with that because uh, I think we've been pretty public about we've not supported it, but not for the reasons that you would think. It's not about the consumer or trying to make it hard on consumer. It's about when you control, when you cap a payment, you're moving and you don't deal with the price underlying pricing issues, whether they be medical cost trend or pharma trend or whatever, then you're just pushing it up in the premium. It's like it's a balloon, you know, it's going to go somewhere. So just because you cap a copay doesn't solve your pricing issue. Do I think for low income people there should be some predictability in capping? Of course. But my opposition and AHIP's opposition and plan's opposition is it's a false sense of security about if you don't think there's a premium impact when you do that type of work. I'd, I'd even say the same from ARP's perspective. We think that some co-payments are really onerous, particularly I'm sure for your patients who um, are for, through Part B paying 20% of specialty drugs. Um, that said, we have to deal with the cost of the drugs or everybody's insurance rates and everybody's Medicare costs are going to go up. Josh, you want to? Yeah, I'll just say, you know, again, I don't think that's the solution to the real problem. The underlying problem is that you know, the 3 to 4% of our sickest, most vulnerable patients are being punished for their biology right now with coinsurance rates of 30 to 40% in a large number of plans. And that's just not right. There's no clinical or policy rationale for that. We have to address that core issue through better value-based insurance design. Now you're interested in value when, only when it's insurance design. Hi, my name is Samuel Pandi. I work at Pharma. I have a question for you. As a, a couple weeks ago, IMS Health published their use of medicines report. In that use of medicines report, they have a chart which tracks between invoice price growth and net price growth, net price being after rebates and discounts. In 2015, they said that net price growth was 2.8% for, for branded products in the U.S. market. Not the, uh, look, it's not the only price assessment. Uh, other price assessments uh, by other organizations have come that this is another year of where we're in double digit, we're over uh, 10%. Let me just say, let me just say, one of the problems of not having price information around is you get a report by this person on a narrow segment, you get a report by this group on a narrow segment. Uh, the most recent stuff I've looked at uh, by insurance, what insurance companies are paying and what proportion of their dollars are going to drug pricing. So a lot of us look at the national health expenditures done by the Office of the Actuary that shows we're about 10% of total health care expenditures are by our drugs. And that, of course, has the footnote, which no one ever reads, retail outlets, right? Doesn't include the hospital or the nursing home or the skilled facilities. Then the new ASPE report uh, comes out, says it's 16.7% of total expenditures when you take all in. The problem with that number is that that's actually not a number we experience because that also includes NIH research, public health research in the denominator, and lots of things. So if you go to the insurance industry and you say, all right, guys, let's look under the hood. Let's look under my premium. How much are you paying? What's the proportion of your spend on drugs? It turns out that it's now past 20%. And for many of the insurance companies, it now exceeds in-hospital payment. And so when you say to me, oh, drugs are a small, small, small fraction. And then I go to my insurance company and say, what small fraction? It's more than in hospital payments. It's like, guys, I understand that, you know, we can all create a shell game where the price looks low and the total expenditure looks low. But the reality is, for those of us who have insurance, uh, you know, the 160 million Americans and the people on Medicare and Part D, Turns out it's really a big portion of the total expenditure. So I don't want to debate this individual report, that individual report. The problem with lack of transparency about the pricing is you guys can always tell. We give discounts. Show me the discounts. Can't do that. Question here. Peter Rosenstein, uh, PDR and Associates. My question it would be to Marilyn. Uh, when the insurance company changes the level of the drug, and changes what tier it's on, so that people, instead of paying 20% copay, are now paying 50% in some cases. Is the insurance company willing to explain to the person who's paying that the difference in your cost of that drug? 
why you suddenly raised it by a 30% copay? Are you paying that much more what your discount is? Thank you for the good question. So I think that, again, we already have some insurance plans who are doing that. And many times these negotiations are done in advance, uh, particularly on employer-based, and may go into a different calendar year. And not all of this is about price increases for pharma. I'll defend pharma. Um, some of this is about employers making decisions about how much the employee is going to pay plus the versus the employer, the percentage. But yes, we have tried to be clear about that, explain that more. One of the things that the Affordable Care Act did um, with the MLR requirement is it requires us to be more visible about what, what's going where and why, and we've tried to do that on pharma as well. So happy to handle any individual issues and get you connected with the right plan. Okay. This woman right here. Uh, my name is Katie Allen with Horizon Government Affairs, and we're fortunate enough to work with pharma and payers, a couple different sectors. And I continue to hear information of, or the push for value-based insurance design. What is preventing that from happening? We're starting to see shifts in paying for value in other sectors. What's preventing it in pharmaceutical industry? Well, I think that maybe that was one well. Of the so I would yeah. say it's this is where I wouldn't want to paint all pharma is the same because we have some pharma relationships where they are more open to doing this and I mentioned a couple earlier and Amgen certainly one of them but I would say that as an, uh, an industry they have not yet embraced it and been willing to move forward and we're doing everything we can to encourage that but it takes two people at the table. Last question sir right here right. second row. Stanley Campbell with Eagle Force Associates we're uh, analytics company and we work both with insurance and um, and with Amgen. Uh, Hold um, it up so we can hear <coughs> you. The, the, um, um, oh, oh, the question is are we looking at it kind of the right way? Obviously when we look at value base our, our clients you know CVS Caremart, um, Cardinal come to us for uh, precision medicine. They want to know um, um, who is the sickest of the sick and then how can I track not just a single medication but multiple medications? Um, the, the, the issues as we see them, when we start with What's what your is question? Yeah, when we start with what is given, we get maybe 10 elements, first name, last name, date of birth, medication, address. Um, when we do the analysis, we've got 900 data elements on the doctor, 1,000 data elements on the on the patient, which are all weighted guidelines in a neural computing system that is question. The, the, the question is, are we looking at it the wrong way? Should we be identifying the 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 value based on where the target is? The target is the sick patient, not so much the price, because if we can shift that risk to the patients uh, 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 to the providers as we have, and we narrow it down, on the numbers of folks that we have to treat with the highest priced drugs. We, we make an evaluation on a million Maybe dollar med. Okay. A million dollar okay. med yeah. in I one, with, with, with okay. a baby. Okay, I think we've got it. <laughs> uh, I think I understand your question. I think, let me, let me say two things in response, because I think it's an important question. You're, you're basically asking, you know, with the proper data available to us, can we make better, can we get better information uh, to do appropriate therapy, use value. And, and here's the thing everybody needs to understand. Value assessments, the very nature of them, uh, is a one-size-fits-all approach. It is taking the average effect and applying it to everybody. And that is one <coughs> of the limitations and why it should just be one input in many. What you're talking about is using actual data to really understand population and individual patient risk and targeting therapeutics and, and costly interventions better. And, and that is the future for sure. But if we move to this monolithic system of a one-size-fits-all value assessment, we will never get there. And so we believe that this is an important input, but that the real value is when we can get the right data and understand. So my belief is we should let technology diffuse into the market collect data, and do value assessments with real information rather than guesswork. Okay. We've got uh, three minutes left to go. You have one minute for last thoughts, Deb. Oh, I was going to leave Deb then. Okay. Uh, I, I guess I, 
I'll use it. <laughs> Good. I think, I think, I think the conversation about value shows why we're not doing it. It is very difficult. It is very difficult because even one drug can have many indications. And you know, can we pay for the same drug for different treatments based on the indication? That gets even more complex. Um, that said, we have to do something different. The current system is not working. And while I get that the move to states grasping for straws to say, we're going to use the VA because we can't afford what we are doing now, may not be the right one for our society. I think we do, and I was very impressed by the congressman's talk today. I, I think we need to do take a look at this holistically, look at the model that we have, and say, where do we need to start over, and where we can do it across all payers and all providers in the in industry. Um, I think we can have some real successes. We spend too much on drugs. It hurts patients. We need to do something. Thank you. Josh, a minute? Yeah, I'd just say that uh, I think we all are unfortunately looking at this issue through some very narrow silos. And we need to take a step back and look at healthcare spending in its totality and identify things that are not working and stop paying for them. And I eliminate the waste. The Express Script says there's over $400 billion in pharmaceutical waste every year. That's more than we spend on drugs every year. How could there be $400 because it billion, includes, billion in waste? It includes the health consequences of poor adherence and poor utilization. So they've included this. We have to get at that waste. We have to stop paying for things that don't work so that we can invest appropriately in the things that work. But it takes a societal perspective and a patient perspective to get at that. And I think, I hope we can all come together and, and work through that lens. By the way, even if we took out that $400 billion, we're still spending substantially more than any other country in the world. So it doesn't give us a lot of headroom. We're just getting back to near normal. Marilyn. Well, I, I would say that obviously from my comments, I'm a big believer in value-based design. And to, to your point there, I, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And you, you're on to something in that there is part of the waste and inefficiency and the getting, folks getting the wrong medication. There's a bigger problem right now with it being priced beyond someone's ability to take it. And we have study after study that shows noncompliance and illness continues. So I think we've got multiple issues, but we've got natural database in Medicare Advantage. We've got a natural database in employer market. There are places we could start, to your point. It can spread across multiple markets. We've got to start somewhere. OK. Uh, I think you've heard some interesting uh, results. Uh, we may not be completely for transparency. Probably the first place you've ever heard in Washington not for transparency besides the CIA and the National Security Administration. Uh, we're not completely for value-based pricing uh, because it's too complicated. Uh, but we are for doing something different, exactly what that is, multiple things on the table. And obviously, I think the discussion is going to continue. And if, if anything passes in California, or even comes pretty close, um, I think we're going to see a lot more action on this because the pain is getting pretty intolerable. And even with lots of lobbying, once the pain gets super intolerable for the American public, something happens. Thank you very much for your attention and your questions.